Okay, so we've been talking about stress, uh, and we decided last time that stress, you know, contrary to what this equation says, that it appears to look like just a quantity, a scalar quantity. It has to be more than that, um, and we, because of its, you know, force is certainly a vector, so it's at least a vector, but then because of its coordinate frame dependence, uh, we decided it has to be something else and that is a tensor. All right, so we're going to go ahead and show how that comes about today. Um, what happened? I want a whiteboard. Okay. So let's cut a chunk of the Earth's crust away. Because that's the context we're talking about stress, right? Stress in the Earth's crust. Well, most of the Earth's crust is in compression. So there's forces acting on all sides. And while I say most of the Earth's crust, I will show uh, quickly a counterexample. In the <coughs> far region in Ethiopia, there's actually a place where the Earth's crust is pulling apart. It's tearing apart, it's cutting in a, a rift. And in fact, this thing that looks like a river is a depression in the Earth not from erosion like a river, right, but, but rather from uh, the earth actually tearing apart. So, of course, this is a counterexample to what I said. This, this is one place, at least, in the earth where the crust is in significant tension. But for the most part, and for sort of all practical purposes in this class, we'll assume that the earth is always in compression. And so these forces that act on any uh, section of the Earth's crust, if we you know, normalize them some, by some area, these things are, we call them tractions. Tractions. So they're like stress vectors. So force divided by some area. So if I were to, you know, so as I've drawn it, uh, you know, a fairly large piece of the crust, a, a, a finite size thing, if I were then to zoom in on some infinitesimal cube inside, inside there. Right? So if this thing is in equilibrium, which it has to be if it's not in motion, right, and flying around, if it's in equilibrium, then the same forces that are acting on this large piece of the crust must be also acting on my infinitesimally small cube there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out my infinitesimally small cube, and I'm going to stick it onto a coordinate axis. So my coordinate axis will be like this. Call this x1, x2, x3, and then we'll put the cube on it. Oops. And since the same tractions that are acting on the crust must be acting on my little cube, let's draw them and give them some labels. So from this face, we have a traction. 
We call them fractions, so we use the symbol T. It's a vector. And this face we're going to identify with a unit vector E2. Right? And so we're going to, since we call it E2 uh, because it's in the x2 direction, right? a coordinate system. So this is a unit vector that's in the x2 direction. And just to, <coughs> just to be clear, our traction vector, we're going to label it with that E2 also. <coughs> now, the traction vector itself is not in the E2 direction. It's clear from the way I've drawn it. Right? However, it emanates from the surface that's defined by the E2 direction. Right? So our cube only has one surface where E2 is normal to it. The one on the other side would be normal to negative E2. So this traction has three components. It's a vector, and it emanates from the E2 surface. So we'll use it like, we'll write it like that. And so likewise, here we have another traction vector that emanates from the E3 surface where E3 is a unit vector that points in the x3 direction. We also have a unit vector in the x1 direction, E1. And we have a traction vector, E1. Okay. Now, because the thing's in equilibrium, My, you know, the plot's going to get kind of busy here, but because the, the thing's in equilibrium, if I have a, a positive TE2 on this face, on the, on the reverse face, there has to be a negative TE2. Right? So back there, it'll be a negative e, TE2. I'll go ahead and try to draw it as best I can. So this is like negative TE2. Uh, there's a negative, I'm sorry, that would be negative TE1. <coughs> TE1. <coughs> Back here, there's a negative TE2. And then down here, there's a negative TE3. Okay. So then the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to cut my little cube on a plane like this. So if I cut my cube on that plane, what what shape is left? Like what's what's between this plane and the, and the axes? There's a little parallel pipe. To, yeah, it's a tetrahedron, right? So there's a, there's a triangular base, and they go and it, you know if you it goes down to a point at the origin. Uh, so that's how we got that, and this is a much cleaner drawing. Right. So when I've, once I've cut it, right, then all you can see that's left are the normals on the back side, which were the negative t, right? And the only thing we've done now is we've defined a new unit vector in that's normal to this face, the plane that we've cut it, 
And it also has attraction because the thing's in equilibrium. Right? It's not flying around. We've also given the areas some labels. So the label of this, uh, you know, the, this main. Um, remember, I said this thing was infinitesimally small, right? So if the cube's infinitesimally small, these areas are infinitesimally small, right? So, so the area of this plane is dA1, <laughs> uh, and then the areas, you know, of the bottom plane is dA3, dA2, dA1. Okay. So the normal vector n. It has its own components, n1, n2, n3. And I mean, I don't know what they, what they are, but I know that they are the cosine of the angle between n and the x1 direction, and the cosine of the angle between n and the x2 direction and the cosine of the angle between n and the x3 direction. So that's what the components of the vector n are. Right? They form the cosine. Is that, is that clear? So n1 would be the cosine of the angle between this and the x1. And it's the projection of this down onto the x1 axis. And then, uh, just for what we're going to do next, I just to make something clear, if, if I have a if I have a line L, right, and say I want to know what its projection is down on to this line, where I have the angle in between is theta. What so what's the projection of of L onto this line? <coughs> L cosine theta, right? So so again, remember the projection I'm talking about. This distance is L cosine theta. Right, so you all know that for a line. Right? Well, that same sort of rule applies if I were to extend this line onto a plane. Right? So if I were to then, say, extend this line onto a plane and, ex and extend my projected surface or projected line into a plane. So you know, here I'm asking, sort of, you know, what what is the you know, this is my plane. So green and orange would make yellow, right? Something like that. So, so the, the yellow area, the area underneath, that's that's what I'm looking for. Right? So this this same sort of rule applies if I were to say that give this a label uh, A, say this plane has area A, and I want to know what the projection is A prime. Well that the projection down here, this is A prime, that yellow region underneath. And that follows the same sort of rule that A cosine theta. <coughs> A prime is A cosine theta. And so we'll use that idea in just a second. <coughs> so <coughs> Whenever you set out to solve a mechanics problem and you don't know what else to do, where do you think you should start? Well, free body diagram, but that's what that is, right? So we, we already have that. So what's next? 
No. Force balance, all right? Force balance. You said x direction, but let's just write, I mean, you can write down the force balance in vector form, right? So there's another name for, for there's a couple of more names for force balance, like Newton's second law, right? Or more generally, uh, conservation of momentum, in this case, conservation of linear momentum. So that's what we're going to do. Whenever, whenever in doubt and you set out to solve a mechanics problem, start with F equals MF. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to write F equals MA in vector form for our tetrahedron. Right? So there's really only one positive vector. Tn, right? So we're going to say Tn, right? Remember I said these tractions of force per unit area? But we want to write F equals Ma, right? So we're going to write force per unit area. We need to multiply by an area. And the area we're going to multiply by is this area here. Right? So this, this traction acts on this area, dA. So we have dA minus right, T in the E1 direction. And then using this rule of how the cosine of the areas and the fact that the component N1 is the cosine between N and the X1 axis, then we can say that dA1 is, in fact, N1 dA. And then we can write minus T E2 is N2 dA minus T E3 N3 dA, right? So that's F. Those are the sum of the forces on our body, a little tetrahedron. And that's equal to Ma. Well, mass is density times volume. I don't know what the density is, so we'll just use rho. Times volume, what's the volume of a tetrahedron? Well, the base has equal sides. It's one third the base times the, uh, the the area of the base times the height. Right? The area of the base is dA. The height is labeled there. So this h is the distance between the centroid of this area and the and the origin. Right? So one third dA times h. So that's mass. That's m. Right. And then A is the acceleration. We'll just write that, acceleration vector. <coughs> so that's F equals MA. Well, one thing you see immediately is that there's a DA in every term. So we can cancel them. Right. And then the other thing is, you know, this is an infinitesimal cube. Right. So. Well, it started with, you know, we, we claimed it was an infinitesimal cube. So if it's infinitesimal, it actually, you know, the height is a, is a number that tends towards zero. Right? So we actually want to take the limit of this as h goes to zero. So we take uh, take the limit as h goes to zero. Well, that makes that whole term go to zero. Right? And then we end up with T in one equal to T E one in one minus T E two plus N two N 
Now remember, these superscripts just identify the faces that these vectors emanate from. The vectors themselves, the retractions themselves, are vectors. They have three components on their own. So while I've written one equation, this is really three equations. Right? Those three equations, if we write them out in, in component form, are T1, N, <coughs> T2, N, T3, N, is equal to Or I just was kind of lazy there. I used a shorthand, so this is should be on all of those guys. So then it should be clear we could write this as a matrix equation. I think I'll just go back here. this guy. And so it's it's this guy here that is the stress. And it's a tensor. And if you write this equation in in a compact notation, oops. you'd have uh, T is equal to this guy. And this is called the Cauchy stress equation. But that defines, this equation is actually what in, fi in fact defines the stress. And it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this class, but in fact, just because we're going to use a convention, remember, I said that the E's just define the face, right? And later we're going to use a convention where we're not going to carry these superscripts and subscripts. We're just going to use, like we would in a matrix, we're going to use two subscripts to define the components. And to use a similar um, to use a similar notation as we do for matrices, like this, right? 
is just in in this notation the first component defines the face and the second co defines the component of the stress on that face the component of attraction on that face and so it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this class because we'll we'll, we'll find out soon that the Stress we use, this is called the Cauchy stress, is actually symmetric, so it is its transpose. But technically, if you look at how we derive the equation in this notation that we use, uh, what's up there is in fact the stress transpose. Okay. Again, it won't matter for the purposes of this class because the stress will equal its transpose. But if you ever to take a graduate course in continuum mechanics, you'd learn why this is important. Because you can have different, uh, if you have very large deformations, you can have different uh, definitions of stress, and then the stress is not necessarily symmetric. So just to be complete, then So this is the notation we'll use in class, and this is how it corresponds to the original deformation, uh, definition. So you see that what we actually wrote down was the stress transpose. So we're back, oops, we're back here, and there it is. That's what we derived. So the common notation in mechanics is to use sigma for stress. It was probably what you used when you took 319, engineering mechanics 319. And there's the visual definition, right? So if we go back to our tetrahedron, I mean, uh, back to our little infinitesimal cube where we define the unit vectors, right? So that you have the an attraction vector uh, emanating from each face. Then the stress on those faces, you can see like this is the E2 face. So then you have these three components of this traction. Uh, and they all start with a 2 because they come off the 2 face, right? And then you just have the, the components are the directions, right? So the 1 direction, the 2 direction, the 3 direction. So that's very important to keep track of. Everybody understand that? So the first, I'm going to say it for the tenth time, the first component is the face. The second component is the direction. 